So everyone, thank you for joining us today. We're just going to wait another moment for a few more folks to sign on. Thanks. Hi everyone, welcome to the TBR webinar series. Today, Principal, Anal Principal Analyst Chris Antlitz will be discussing leading CSPs and web skills implement new ICT architecture to fully capitalize on digital era. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping notes. At the bottom of your screen, you can access the slides, audio controls, Q&A, speaker bios, and our survey. After the webinar, you will receive an email with a replay link as well as a link to view and register for other TBR webinars. If you have any questions for us, please submit them in the Q&A widget in ON24. You may also reach out to us after the event at webinars at tbri.com. Thank you again for joining us and here's Chris to begin the webinar. Great, thanks Sarah and welcome everyone. So today we're gonna to be talking about the key findings from our 2020 Telecom Predictions Special Report. And if anybody, if the audio isn't working for anyone, um, I'm gonna dial in just because we're having a little bit of choppiness with the phone. I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back. So hopefully that's better. Um, today we're gonna to be talking about our 2020 Telecom Predictions Special Report. And we, so this webinar is a derivative of a report that we wrote, um, which is available for anyone. Um, and if you email Sarah after the call, she can make the full report available to you. Um, it includes the data that we're showing in this webinar, and it also includes some other um, content that we, we aren't going to be able to get to today. So the title is uh, Leading CSPs and Web Scales, Implementing ICT Architecture to Fully Capitalize on the Digital Era. That's the theme for the predictions for this year. And going forward, this is a multi-year thing. So this is me, uh, Chris Antlitz, Principal Analyst in the Telecom Practice at TBR. There's my email address. Feel free to reach out if you want or find me on LinkedIn. 
Before we jump into the meat of the presentation, this what we're going to show you, the data and the content is from these reports that we are writing um, in our syndicated portfolio. So we have uh, 5G reports, um, NFBSCN, we're tracking the edge compute market, we're looking at the web scales, and we also do a variety of reports on the infrastructure services market. So that's services that vendors get from operators for uh, the full life cycle of infrastructure. So let's jump in with the intro. Um, and I want to set the stage before we go into the three predictions that we have. From a big picture, CSPs are in this multi-year evolutionary state where they need to move from being a traditional telco to being a digital service provider. And this has been ongoing. We've been talking about transformation for several years now if not longer. And I think that this is accelerating now. We're seeing this having to accelerate. And part of the reason this is accelerating is some of the newer technologies, such as 5G, edge computing, artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, et cetera, are kind of coalescing at the same time. And there is pressure on CSPs to capitalize on new value that's created from those technologies. And there's also a risk that they face of seeding that value creation to other players in the ecosystem. We saw this with the 4G cycle. The value creation didn't really go to the telcos, it went to the web scales, it went to the OTT players. And we're at a critical juncture right now where 5G is here, it's starting, and the telcos need to figure out where are they going to end up in this, this next cycle. And that is a basis for some of the predictions we're going to be talking about today. Where do we see that trending, given what we're, we're seeing right now in the market? So big picture, the telcos need to transform the business and they need to transform the network. We're gonna focus on the network today. And the, essentially the networks need to become cloud centric and virtualized container microservices based and cloud native so that they can enable and support these new business models. So we talk about network slicing, we talk about distributed computing, and we talk about low latency, mission critical, um, these different aspects to um, this value creation that the CSPs are expected to participate in, the reality is their current networks are not optimized to go after those opportunities. They need to re-architect their networks and transform them towards this type of an, inf uh, an infrastructure system that is more web scale like in nature so that they can participate in that value creation. 2020, so we did write this before um, the whole situation going on with the coronavirus, and I do want to make some comments about that. But um, so just keep that in mind. Some of the market data is going to shift a little bit, and we'll talk about why that is. Um, 2020 was supposed to be a springboard year for the market. I think in some aspects it still will be. Um, but some things, I, I my gut feel, given what we know right now, is that um, some initiatives are going to get delayed, uh, could be up to a year. So we might see some of the things I talk about on this call today get pushed out to 2021 and not wind up happening in 2020. Um, CapEx, we did expect it to increase this year. Um, that is tentative. We might see the CapEx increase next year, and the increase might be a little more um, higher then a more gradual rise than we were originally anticipating as operators catch up with investments and as the supply chain settles down and goes back to normal. Um, disruptive vendors, we're gonna be talking about them on this call. They, they do pose a threat um, to incumbent OEMs and they are vying for a piece of this new architecture with CSPs and there are 
a, a growing list of examples, some of which we'll talk about today, where these smaller, more nimble vendors are taking market share from established incumbent vendors. And we'll talk about where some of those areas are in the network. And last but not least here, we will be talking about web scales because they are increasingly encroaching on CSP turf. And they are concurrently looking at these new technologies that we mentioned before and how to build bigger businesses, new and big businesses for their own um, their own businesses, right? So the web scales are trying to also grow and encroach and take share in some of this value creation. And we're going to talk about where we see that um, playing out. Okay, so this sets the stage. We are going to jump into the predictions now. And I just want to, that setting of the stage is the backdrop for what we're going to talk about now. So the first prediction we have is pertaining to the web scales and the web scales are building out the edge. Um, what is the edge? So let's start there, and then we can talk about what that, those, uh, the data in this chart means and talk about what's going on in this space. So when I say edge, what we're talking about is not regional data centers. We are talking about far edge sites. So it can be anywhere between the gateway to the regional center. Anything in between there from a proximity standpoint, we are including in the edge. So that includes things such as the base of a cell tower. It could be an on-premise edge stack, like an AWS Outposts or an Azure stack. It could be a central office. It could be an ag hub. Um, it could be a rooftop site. It could be a BBU hotel. Uh, it could be a metro pop, um, a, a metro CO, um, depending on the proximity and what use cases that site is supporting. Is it low latency stuff? Is it, or is it just aggregating up traffic as as normal? So those are the types of sites that we have boundarized. So these market size numbers you see here. Um, they include central cloud and edge cloud. So the dark green is the central cloud, which is your megawatt data centers, and it's your regional data centers. So tier one cities, um, some tier two cities, those data centers are in that dark green. And the light green is the far edge build out, where, I, where we talked about before, the, that boundarization of the proximities between the endpoint and where that traffic is headed going into the network and back out. Um, the market size includes the big nine. So that is Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Google, Microsoft. It includes Rakuten, and it includes Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent. So there's nine web scales in that market size. What we did is we added up their data center related spend. This is CapEx specifically. And what we did is we applied a split to that based on research that we've conducted around their pacing and their roadmaps for edge, for far edge stuff. And our assumption is by 2024 or in, or sorry, 2023, um, there's gonna be a significant shift from central cloud build out to edge cloud build out. This has already started. Um, and the best example we have today of that happening is AWS Wavelength. They have struck deals with at least five operators globally, including Verizon, KDDI, um, there's a few others, where they are siting their edge stack at, a, at an ag hub in the telco network, plugging into the telco last mile for the connectivity, and they are basic, they've basically extended out their public cloud to the edge uh, with the purposes of doing low latency, um, you know, workload, uh, handling those workloads. Um, there's also data, you know, privacy, residency type reasons why they would do something like that. Um, but the point is, is that this is already happening. Um, AWS has already built this out in multiple countries. They're in the test phase right now. They've piloted 
these edge stacks in those telco sites, and they have ambitions to build this out uh, dramatically over the next, you know, the next five years. And, and AWS is the leader of the big nine in this. Um, Rakuten is also a leader here. They're building their network in Japan, which uses 4,000 edge sites. Those are far edge locations that are processing RAN traffic, and they're also interfacing with the central cloud to do distributed computing. That's their architecture. So there are already examples of that happening, and if you look there, 2019 is when this really started. That's what our earliest indications that this started among the big nine was in 2019, and you can see that's going to scale out from there. So why are the web scales going to do this? What is the point? So there's a couple of key reasons why they are going to shift this spend to the far edge. The first one is the cloud and extending the cloud business to capitalize on more of the market that is available to them, making a bigger addressable market. So today I would gener I'd make a broad generalization and say most of the cloud workloads that are running in the public cloud today are... Um, you know, things like Salesforce, Workday, those types of SaaS-based platforms that are being hosted from a, a public cloud. That is going to change over the next five years. Yes, that's going to continue to happen for those aforementioned uh, situations, but we're going to see mission-critical workloads start to come into the fold here. And the reason that enterprises would want to do this is the cost points are attractive. Instead of owning, controlling, and CapEx expensing their own data centers, they can lean on their web scale public cloud providers to host and manage and orchestrate some of these workloads for them. And this is exactly what Amazon and Microsoft and Google are planning to do here. So that's one aspect. The second key reason why this is going to happen is for consumer, consumer use cases. And I wrap that under an umbrella phrase is digital lifestyle initiatives. So the, the web scales are building ecosystems, end-to-end -end digital lifestyle ecosystems where end users being consumers are part of that ecosystem. Now, what does that look like? That, let me give you an example to, to think about. Amazon is the retailer. They do advertising, they, do, um, they are in the cars, they're getting into the cars with Alexa. Alexa is all over the place now, that voice AI platform. Um, what they want to do is, uh, they also have the media, <clears throat> I, I should mention that, and gaming. Those are two other key areas that they are wor uh, you know, diligently working in. If you can pull those types of platforms together in a seamless way, you can make uh, uh, quality of experience. You can make different experiences that are completely different from what other companies could offer. So, for example, you wake up in the morning, you talk to Alexa, and Alexa controls your vehicle. You wake up in the morning and you tell Alexa, turn on the car and open the garage door. Your house will be connected to uh, the Alexa platform, your car infotainment system, and some aspects of the management system of that vehicle will also be integrated with Alexa, and it will tell that what to do. You can tell Alexa to ship something to and drop it, um, I don't know, in your backyard. You want a new, I don't know, something for your pool, uh, a pool uh, something. So you order it, or you tell Alexa that you want it, and a drone drops it in your backyard. These are the types of permutations you can expect to see as we move through the latter part of this decade. In order to realize these types of outcomes, the web scales must have low latency, uh, ubiquitous intelligent connectivity end to end. And this is where the edge comes in and this is why they must have a, pr a presence, a scaled presence at the far edge of the network. Okay, so, um, you know, the, the, the spend is going to shift. We've already started to see this. Um, I, my suspicion is Wavelength is going to become uh, many, many telcos around the world are going to jump on that bandwagon because they have to, um, in, in, you know, if we're being honest here. 
Um, customers will push them to partner with Amazon on these types of things so that the enterprise can benefit from this distributed computing um, architecture. Um, and you know, this, there, there's a real risk here that the CSPs might get uh, relegated to just providing connectivity. And that is a very real threat here as we see web scales take point position um, early on in this space. I expect that there will be edge stacks at many cell sites, um, not only across this country, but you know, as we go down to the latter part of this decade, um, that is going to be a key location for putting edge resources and also central offices, um, BBU, uh, hotels, um, redeveloped uh, retail real estate that's being freed up from the Amazonification of retail. Um, there's many different sites and locations that these edge stacks can be put in and ownership models that, that can be realized from this. Okay, so the next prediction is around VRAN. VRAN is something that has been talked about for several years at least, um, but it hasn't really happened. And there's some reasons why it hasn't happened. There's technical issues. There are uh, vendor issues where they don't want to open interfaces and um, subject themselves to that disruption for as long as they possibly can. But the reality is VRAN will ultimately happen, and we see some indicators that it is, in fact, already happening. And that's what I really want to hone in on on this discussion. Over the next five years, CSPs will begin deploying VRAN in commercial uh, production environments. So we, we will see this. We've, we've seen RFPs get issued already by Vodafone and a few other operators, some in Africa, um, as some examples, that are tasking the vendor community uh, looking for solutions to defray the cost of building and operating and owning mobile networks, the access layer of the network. This is where VRAN comes in because in theory, you can get cost savings from VRAN of you know 30-ish percent versus a traditional system. And that is very attractive when you consider that the number one largest cost of building a mobile network is the RAN layer. It's about half the cost of building a full end-to-end -end mobile network is the RAN's part of that. And if you can reduce that by, you know, even 20%, say, um, that, that savings is, is very attractive to the operators that are struggling financially and need to, you know, justify business cases for 5G use cases. And, you know, they, they're under pressure to look for uh, models and systems that will help them um, reduce the capex intensity of owning, uh, of building, owning, and operating these networks. So um, this is happening. The market size that we're showing here, I want to be very clear what that includes and what that does not include. So there is some fine print there. Um, we are including the front hall and the virtual BBU. So that's the virtual instance of the RAN that resides in the edge stack near the RRUs and the um, uh, near the RRUs. So we have the front hall part and we have the the virtual BBU. We're also including the remote radio heads in this spend. So those are three aspects of the the stack, the 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 build that you would need for VRAN architecture. This market size does not include the NFVI. So it does not include the actual um, the, the, the data center stack that is required to host the virtual BBU. So we really tried to isolate here what is just the um, virtual uh, the virtual aspect of the RAN system of that software and we isolated out the physical components that are not a data center but are required for a VRAN build. So that's what you're seeing in that market size. Um, so again, this is going to happen. This is happening. Mavenir, Parallel Wireless, Altio Star are the big three to watch. Um, there is some traction there. Um, they are in the tests, the, the test labs of some very big, well-known operators. 
and um, they're also winning some small scale deals to prove that these technologies work in a commercial uh, environment. And they do work, I, I have seen them work. So I, from what I've seen um, suggest that yes, these systems do work. I think the bigger question is how well and how fast can they be scaled? That's a key challenge and we actually are gonna come back to that in the third prediction. Okay, so third prediction. So we talked about the architecture of the network is fundamentally changing. It's gonna become cloud centric and cloud native. And that is very different from how operators have traditionally um, built and architected networks. And this creates vectors for disruption, for disruptors to come in and take share from the way things used to be. So in this chart, we are showing two uh, two things here. On the left-hand side is the traditional model, and the right-hand side is a model that we believe is very disruptive, and I would argue we are already seeing some instances of that happening in, in, um, in certain operators. So, uh, let's unpack what these models are and where the, the change is. So, traditionally, when you buy network infrastructure, that comes with product attached services such as installation, support, and maintenance. That's not really changing much. Um, what would happen though is the provider of those services would be the network solution provider, which is technically an incumbent OEM like an Ericsson or a Nokia. So they would work with SI partners, uh, shared infrastructure owners um, such as an Equinix, um, they would work with subcontractors like a Mastech, a DICOM, Black & Veatch, those types of companies. And they would also work with OEMs and ODMs to package together the infrastructure and implement it into the CSP environment and operationalize it. Now, I'm making general statements here, but generally speaking, that is the model. That's the way it has been. The new model is once we go to disaggregated, um, once we disaggregate hardware from software, the stickiness that a CSP has to the OEM is dramatically reduced. And you all of a sudden have an opportunity for companies that are relatively small and more nimble that have best of breed software um, and attractive value propositions and commercial models can interject themselves into this value chain and work their way into these telco environments. So whereas before a telco might have bought an end-to-end -end network solution for say LTE, the model for 5G networks will be disaggregated and there's gonna be more vendors in those systems, embedded in those systems. So when that happens, and hardware becomes increasingly commoditized and goes white box over time, there is a gap in the market for someone to fill the role of implementing the, pulling everything together in the value chain, integrating it and implementing it, operationalizing it into the CSP environment. So we believe that that gap will be filled by what we call a prime system integrator. A prime system integrator is companies such as Tech Mahindra, Accenture, IBM, Infosys, TCS. These are all companies that we believe are going to fulfill aspects of or the entirety of that role as they help operators transform their networks. Now, this is not crazy by any means, because if you look at the business models of those companies I just rattled off, they have helped companies across many verticals with IT virtualization and IT overhaul and transformation. When you look at cloudification of networks and virtualizing network functions, it's not that much different from doing applying those techniques in the IT domain. Yes, there is differences, but it is um, if these companies have existing exp expertise and capability to do this, and they have best practices, 
they are in point position to fulfill this role. So I believe we're going to see these types of situations where SIs will fulfill this role and will build aspects of or orchestrate resources to build aspects of these networks for the CSP. So let me walk you through an example of this. Um, so the arrows pointing to the prime SI are software providers, SI subcontractors, shared infrastructure owners like data center REITs and tower companies, um, OSP, ISP, EPC firms, those are like MassTech, DICOM, those types of companies, Bechtel. Um, OEM, ODM is your, um, you know, could be an Ericsson, Nokia, could be um, ODM white box makers out of Taiwan or China. Um, and then also um, cloud providers such as we talked about before, the web scales, they will also have a critical role in the future networks. Um, so a prime SI in these situations would work with companies like a Maveneer or an AWS um, or a white box vendor, and they would work, they would be that glue that would work with and orchestrate um, and make the, the critical decisions as they build these systems for CSPs. You know, a lot of CSPs out there globally, not all CSPs are have internal staff that do network builds. In, in fact, in many cases around the world, there's more instances where CSPs rely on vendors to do these network builds for them because they don't have those resources anymore for whatever reason. So a lot of these network builds and initial oper operationalizations um, actually take place from the vendor to the operator. So this model can be hugely disruptive to the status quo and the way things have been. Um, and yes, incumbent NSPs, this is a, this is a big threat. Um, you know, if you're selling a RAN system where you buy your base station equipment, your antenna, your, um, you know, maybe some backhaul and other aspects of that system from a vendor, and that system works, the hardware and the software is tightly integrated and proprietary, where we're shifting to a more open infrastructure-based model that is using commodity physical hardware and using best-of-breed software riding on top of that, that is fundamentally different. And that is where 5G is ultimately going to take us. It's going to take us to that latter type of an architecture. Okay, so um, if anybody has questions, please add them to the Q&A function. I'm going to go over the key takeaways, and then we're going to open it up for Q&A. So CSPs, you know, they're, they are finishing up with the LTE cycle in the developed world especially. And now they're facing 5G and they're facing the complexity that 5G brings to them. They need to re-architect the networks to be more cloud-centric. And they need to become agile and, and they need to digitalize. This is a fundamental transformation. Um, and this, they need to avoid a repeat of the LTE cycle. This can't happen again. Um, it's, it's not going to end well if, if that happens again for some, uh, some telcos. And the new value is, is, is very much of a threat that that will accrue to other players and that CSPs will be stuck with the connectivity. This is a very real uh, threat to the CSPs. And I would argue that we are already seeing situations where CSPs are seeding and um, kind of staying in their swim lane of connectivity. So, uh, CSPs that don't accelerate, um, they risk seeding this value from 5G, edge computing, and other new technologies to the web scales and other disruptors in the ecosystem. They need to accelerate migration to a cloud-centric network architecture to remain competitive, so more of a web scale-like network. Um, they need to, um, this is going to cause CapEx to increase. So yes, legacy infrastructure spend is going down, but because CSPs need to accelerate the infrastructure spend, um, 
that is going to cause an increase in CapEx. Now, I want to talk about the coronavirus for a few minutes here because this, this actually is going to impact the, the telecom ecosystem. I think it's going to impact it quite a bit more than people realize. Um, so if you look at the areas that are under quarantine and on lockdown, um, there are key globally uh, um, factories there of global significance that produce components that go into infrastructure, um, such as optics um, and, and semiconductors and those types of things that wind up finding their way into a broad range of network infrastructure. Those supply chains are broken down and the, the, it's a chain reaction. So we're at the very early stages of seeing this play out, but our current thinking is that, and again, this is a fluid situation, but given what's happened so far, this could delay 5G builds and new architecture-related builds by up to six months or more, given what's currently happened and the impact that the, the supply chain has currently faced. Um, also, on the device side, we, should, we shouldn't um, just think about infrastructure. Um, Foxconn facilities are impacted and other device-centric um, players in that production chain, um, not only components, but also assembly and shipment of those products around the world. Um, those are delayed as well, arguably more delayed than the infrastructure side. And um, uh, one example is Facebook's Oculus uh, v, um, VR goggles. Those are delayed. Um, they publicly came out and said they, they gave some um, update on where that stands. And that's just an example of the, the supply chain's getting gummed up, and that's going to delay when we see CapEx start to increase. So with all of that said, I think that the um, – and then obviously the CapEx spend in China is going to be mitigated this year. Instead of growing strongly, which is what the original projection was, it's going to be flat. We might even see it decrease this year. Um, with that said, uh, CapEx is going to be a subdued environment this year. Um, but we do expect it to catch up in 2021. So actually, in our forecasts, in our reports, we are going to be shifting out our spend models out to 2021, putting more emphasis on 2021, um, because there's going to be a catch-up period where um, they're going to have to re-ramp up production and catch up to uh, meet the demand in the market. Okay. And then last but not least is web scales intend to own the edge. Um, this is happening. AWS Wavelength is just the, the, the first step of this. Many, many, many operators around the world we expect are going to jump on that bandwagon and partner with AWS to um, leverage the edge sites that telcos already own to um, do joint value creation in, in the far edge. Okay, so that was the content for the session, and we're going to open it up for Q&A now. So for the q and A, I'm going to go right down the list in order that the questions come in. I see there are a bunch of questions already, which is great. So just give me a second here, and, and I will get these teed up. Okay. So... The first question is around sending the deck out. Um, we, we are not making the, the slides from the deck widely available. If you do want the deck, um, please reach out to Sarah and she will get it to you. Um, the special report that this webinar was based off of is widely available to anybody that wants it. So if you do want a copy of that report um, that comes with all the data points and everything we showed in here, um, please reach out to Sarah, and she will um, get you set up with that. Okay. Um, next question is, for equipment vendors, does the opportunity become largely a services play? That's a good question, and actually, I would say yes, it does. So one of the big issues with the edge build-out uh, is who's going to do the work in the field? Who's going to actually dispatch people, smart hands, to go out there in the field at these distributed sites 
and actually put these edge stacks in place and operationalize them. I believe this is a really good opportunity for um, the OEMs to um, mitigate some of the disruption on their core business model, where they can leverage their existing services resources to um, partner with stakeholders in the edge space and rapidly build out and scale out edge compute builds at the far edge. Um, so yes, that uh, the services play I do believe is is good. Um, the the margins are going to be thin though because doing field work is not you know not synonymous with uh, higher margins. But if vendors can have um, tools and best practices that they are using that give them an edge in their in the way that they carry out their business. Um, they might be able to generate sufficient margins where this becomes attractive for them to, to pursue this type of work. Okay, next question. On VRAN, uh, does this count the DU, not the CU? It doesn't count either. It, it is not counting the edge infrastructure. So the data center, the server, the storage infrastructure is not included in that particular view of the market. Um, we do, in our other reports, we do provide the full NFBI spend um, for in, uh, in, other, um, in some of our reports, but we, we aren't putting that in this. And there's a reason for that. The reason is those edge stacks will be workload agnostic. So you'll have edge stacks at the base of cell sites that are running virtual BBU. They'll also be running a whole host of other VNFs and other workloads. It could be enterprise public cloud workloads. Um, that are being ingested into the system. Um, it, it, that, that's why it's, uh, to us, it's problematic to tie the edge stack to the, the VRAN because ultimately, and this is, you know, this is the end state of where this is going, ultimately the physical infrastructure layer is going to be composable and it's going to be agnostic to the workload that's running on top of it. So because of that, we decided to get a head start on that and, and architect our um, market forecasts in this, in this way. Okay, next question. Is intellectual property, what do the SIs bring to the solution? Why them over the network owners? So the SIs are well-versed in IT virtualization and IT transformation, and really it's taking those skill sets and bringing it into the network domain. So they have good positioning already to do this type of stuff. Um, the SIs also do have intellectual property. Um, so if you look at a company like Tech Mahindra, who is more of a telco-centric SI, more emphasized on the telco side, um, especially prior to the acquisition of Mahindra Satyam, uh, going back a few years, they have IP that they've developed over the years that is specific to telco that helps give them a better position to, to carry out these types of builds for the telco. So I, I think about it in those types of ways. So uh, one comment here, not all network CSPs have mobile networks. Please keep that in mind in your predictions. Um, good point, yes. So um, and actually, you know, let's talk about edge computing for a second here because um, MEC, uh, originally MEC stood for mobile edge computing. That's actually problematic and it's limiting. MEC should stand for multi-access edge computing because edge networks will be architected with a mix of mobile and fixed technologies for the last mile. It's not going to be just mobile, and there's reasons for that. One is there's already infrastructure in place to do this, and second of all, there's bandwidth, energy, and other considerations, spectrum uh, constraints that would be reasons why um, you would need to use more of a fixed last a fixed last mile uh, infrastructure to ingress and and uh, send back out the data traffic that's coming in and being processed. Next question is: Is AWS a threat to telcos? So, does this mean telcos versus Amazon? So, yes and no. I think it's a co-opetition. And this is kind of the way it's been already. If you think about content wars and, you know, how telcos are competing against web scales with content, um, I think that that's a good 
um, example of you know where this is what that might look like in the edge where you have telcos and web scales that are vying for a piece of this action uh, with the new use cases and the question is who's going to capture the value at the end of the day and that, so yes it, 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 they do pose a threat but the also the reality is both of those uh, entities need to work with each other to um, you know to forward their businesses. So so there is there does need to be that that degree of coopetition, and I think we see that with the wavelength announcements. I, I think there is some coopetition there. Um, yeah, at least that's my gut feel that there's you know the, it's 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 mutually beneficial to both parties, but also you know there is some element of co of competition there. Okay. Next question. With regard to co-locating web scale services at the central office and scaling that model would seem to impose CapEx on the MNO as these locations aren't intended to scale compute equipment. How will this play out? So, so yes, um, it's happening it's, and it's, it has to happen more broadly. The reason is the telcos are migrating to the new architecture and they need to build they need to convert those COs to data centers anyway. They have to do it in order to run these cloud-centric networks. So the NFBI layer is data centers. There are data centers that are running VNFs. That is the new architecture of the network. So if the telco has to re-architect the CO anyway, clear out those proprietary appliances, make, uh, get rid of the old and bring in the new with the data centers, um, why not colo freed up square footage to web scales that want to co-locate their edge stack? Um, it, it makes sense to do that. Okay, next question is... Let me see here. I think I answered that one already. Okay, next question. Um, CenturyLink is not partnering with any web scales and edge computing. Unlike other providers, what's your view of their approach? Will they be competitive enough compared to web scales and telcos partnering with each other? So, you know, CenturyLink's in a unique situation because um, they actually have opportunities to to um, to grow some revenue here because they have a lot of COs and ag hubs that can be opened up to web scales to, to co-locate and CenturyLink has been co-locating for years. I mean that that's a key business for them and they already have the capabilities and wherewithal to do this um, and to scale that out. So um, I would actually be looking at those traditional telcos, more fixed line type telcos as a key partner of the web scales for them to have a colo arrangement with the web scale to generate revenue, as well as potentially participate in value creation that comes from those relationships. So uh, Frontier is another one I would keep an eye on. Um, you know, they have sites that can be uh, repurposed or they have available square footage today that can be utilized to work with the web scales. And actually CenturyLink and Frontier have both been public about this, um, that they are willing to work with the web scales um, in in these types of um, relationships, so um, you know, I, I would argue that this is already happening. That they're already um, you know having these types of discussions with web scales. Okay, and I think that's all we had for questions. Any others? We still have ten minutes. Okay. All right, I guess there's no more questions. So um, Sarah, I guess we can close up. All right, um, please feel free to reach out to us with any follow-up questions. If you have a few moments, we'd appreciate if you could fill out the survey on your screen. The replay version of the webcast will be available after the event and will be sent out to you via email. To view a list of our upcoming and past webinars, please visit tbri.com. Be sure to join us Wednesday, February 26th for the emerging and evolving landscape of enterprise edge computing. Thank you and have a great day.